about modeling, forecast, analysis. This is what I really, really, you know, my heart's in this. I don't know if there's anybody around that actually worked on this spill. Is there anybody that, that, man, I'm really getting old. All right, so this, this was, this is off of San Francisco, and yours truly told the Coast Guard that this blue ball was never going to come ashore, and then ended up in the car lines. And all hell broke loose, right? You know, sometimes, sometimes you're wrong. That's that's the way it goes. All right, so this is this is uh, a slide, and, and the point. This these are offshore, large offshore spills off the west coast, and. And the point here is that these are rare events, which is a good thing. You know, they don't happen every year, they don't happen every other year. These are the ones that, that we sent people to and did stuff for. Okay, so here's, if you fall asleep, remember these, these points here. And we emphasize the fact that it's a forecast that you want. It's like the weather service, right? They don't, they don't give you the, the model, they give you a forecast. Yeah, and sometimes it's wrong, so if it's important, you've got to think about uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, so some examples. This is a model run. Right? The Hurricane Center does this. They don't give this out. You know, this is available publicly, but this is not what they put out to the press. Instead, they, they actually give a forecast. Yeah, if you look at their the Weather Services uh, website, it's really interesting. They, they have a discussion page. Yeah, they just lay it on the line. You know, it, it's very cool. So they'll, they'll tell you if they think certain models are not doing well. And then they'll, they'll talk about a rationale of how to put out the forecast. So it's really some science and a lot of art. You know, you know, I tell our people, we get paid not to run the models. We get paid to put out a forecast and have a plan. If you're wrong, you've got to have a plan. Okay, so this is, you know, this is what we uh, answer. This is, this is one that's, you know, takes some experience to do How bad will it be? So here's a, here's a good example. These guys, they have their act out, right? This is a Tsunami Warning Center. It, it's, it's a nice graphic they put out to the public, and it really has all the information that you need. What happened? Uh, you know, and it, it gives you times, it gives you the so what question, what, what you can expect. So, you know, we look at the weather service, we look at tsunami folks, see how they interact with the public with their forecast, and, and people understand what they put out, and they understand how to use it. Okay, so once again, if the answers matter, it's a forecast. So, you know, I'm going to show you guys how to run the model. But I would suggest that if the answers really matter, you call Jordan. Because it's better, it's better if we're wrong than you guys are wrong. Okay, you know, if the answers really matter. Okay, so a model. It's always simplifications and it's a hypothesis, right? It's not, it's not God's truth. Otherwise, people would be rich following the stock market. <laughs> okay, so these, these are the type of models that, that we deal with. This is a different type of model that we don't, we don't do in our group. Okay, so academic models. Don't read this stuff. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, the point here is that these are, these are state-of-the-art. A lot of this is... Uh, you know, it's just experimental, and they're pushing the envelope, getting new stuff out there. And I think one of the big groups to do this type of stuff is up here at UCLA. They have a, a group of people that do the ROMS model that are, you know, world famous. They have a guru up there that, uh, that is famous in it. And, you know, they're always tinkering with, with the computer code and trying to make it better. Um, and here are examples. There is a, uh, a model now that's available publicly. If you come at noon, you know, we'll, I'll show you how to get that, how to get this stuff. 
but it runs every day. It covers the whole state of California. Um, gives out current forecast. And, you know, it's pretty good. It's not always right, but it's pretty good. So academic models. So if you go to these guys at UCLA, right, they have one, they have really one kingpin, and he's got a bunch of grad students and postdocs. Um, they're always limited by funding. That's, that's the nature of it. You know, they take it, they set it up for a specific location at a specific scale. Um, they have no backup. You know, they can run stuff, but if the machine goes down, they lose power. It's, it's not there. Big time research tool. Operational models are a little bit different. And I think in the, in the US, the only two entities that really have operational modeling is, is the Navy and NOAA. So deliverables and schedule, stable, they have staffing. People can get sick, they won't leave, it doesn't matter, model will run. They have people doing maintenance, um, you know, continuity of operations. So if a server goes down, a data source goes down, they have backups. Model will always run. The Navy will always do their modeling to support the fleet, and they have backups. So it's there. You can depend on it. So here's here's an example, right? This is this is the uh, the ports system. So there's there's Oakland, and this this model is always running. They have a backup system, and this is kind of cool because you see the uh, the observations versus the model. And so the thought here is that the user looks at this, and you decide whether the model is doing good enough for you or not. So you know we go to this a lot. We went, you know, there's there's one for Galveston, so that's that's what I was looking at Saturday. Uh, they run every day. They do QA. Um, you know, they now nowadays they all use real time data for initializing the model every day. So that's, that's key. Uh, backup, there's, there's always a 24 7 contact with their problems. But these are still location specific, right? A preset grid and time steps. Uh, duration of runs are predetermined. They'll run for 48, 72 hours. If you want something up in two weeks, you ought to lock. <laughs> if the answers are wrong, uh, you're kind of stuck. You know, what NOAA does, if the answers are bad, they just, they just don't serve it out to the public. And then they watch the model, and when the model starts doing well again, then they serve it out. But at least, you know, they don't keep putting out garbage, right? You know, you can call somebody and say, hey, what happened to it? Uh, these are expensive, because you've got to staff it. The operations are expensive. What makes the model wrong? There are a couple of things that make the model. First of all, the, the hypothesis that it's built on could be wrong. For example, if you have a tsunami event, the model is not built to handle that. Uh, the inputs could be wrong. These all take weather forecasts. And like Jordan said, you know, sometimes the forecasts are wrong. So there's stuff like that, that that's wrong.
results from all of these are publicly available. And I will show you at lunch how you tap into these and how you can put these to use. No guarantee that they're going to give you good answers all the time, but it's cool. This is what we do for a living, right? Jordan Cops. So, the deal here is that we don't know where the school is going to be, when it's going to be. It could be out in Guam, it could be out in Puerto Rico, American Samoa, it could be out in Alaska. Uh, you know, we promise people answers in, in short order. And if it's a big spill, we send people in to deal like we have in Texas, and we calibrate daily. You know, we know how well we're doing because the old flights come back. We can compare our results to the old flights. So the rule is that it's got to be simple to set up. You know, it can't take us hours to, to set up. Um, limited data, special initial data would be very limited. We have to be able to fix the results, calibrate quickly. And then we need to express uncertainty. This is something that, that seriously we learned from that Puerto Rican incident on the San Francisco or I think it was. Um, you gotta have uncertainty. Okay, so here's an example of our, our quick quick response tool. We have the ability to, to generate currents, especially tidal currents and, and river output currents, really quick. Even, even though there's no big model that does Humble Bay, we have the ability to, to do this within an hour. And we have, you know, we have NOAA tide predictions, so we can generate pretty good currents. And then once the old flight comes back, we can see how we're doing and we can make adjustments. So we can do this for virtually anywhere in the U.S. And, you know, I think you add another hour or two off of that and we, we can do places outside the U.S. So I think you know we're we're unique in the world to, to the tool set. And think about this: we started in the late '70s, right? And I had hair, and and we had to do this, and we were just coming off card decks. You know, I'm old enough to have computer cards. So how are you going to do this back in the late '70s, early '80s, and, and meet that metric? Well, the, the answer is we developed our own tools. We have our own programmers. We maintain the and uh, you know that that's what you're going to see in here, right? It's our tool set. You know we don't know what the scale is, so we've got to be able to adapt different scales. Okay, so the minuses in our tool set: um, simple hydrodynamics. If it's too complicated, it takes too long to solve. It, it, it's not going to work for us. Which means that you've got to be really smart when you set it up. It's, it's, it's a dumb model. It requires smart users. You've got to know how to manipulate the tools to get what you need. You know, it's like building a house with hammer and nails without all the fancy equipment. You've got to know what you're doing if you're going to come out with a, with a nice house. And uncertainties may be large, part of life. But once the overflights come back, we get a lot better. Okay, so there, there's an example, right? There's, there's our best guess, there's the uncertainty. This one is interesting because the uncertainty had to do with the fact that there was uncertainty in the overflight. And the person that did the overflight didn't know if she saw all the oil as you could go so far out of San Francisco. So, you know, art. So models are not always the same. They all have uncertainty. Uh, you need to use the right set of tools for the right job. And here's what I tell everybody, right? All models will be wrong sometime. As a matter of weather service or stock market or whatever. And no model will be right everywhere at a given time. So if you go to guys at UCLA and say, how good are your models? And they'll tell you that they've done comparisons. But they couldn't tell you how, how well it's going to be for tomorrow or the next day. Because they, they know that you know, it's not always going to be right every day, every hour. Um, so different uses for models. Everybody knows about forecasting forward. OK, that's, that one's no brainer. <coughs> but here's a big one, right? We, there's a lot of this kind of stuff, future spills. Drills, we do a lot of drills. Um, here's another one that was mentioned yesterday. When it's 
stuff come from? The dead whale on the beach, the, uh, the body on the beach, the, uh, yeah, the bale of cocaine that the Coast Guard found on the beach. Where did it come from? Uh, and it's a good educational tool. So I think if, if you come at noon today, you, you get to play with the tools. It's, it's a good way to get a feel for how things are out there. It's, it's really good to do that. So here's an example of planning for a spill. This is kind of cool. So this, this is the chucks you see, and this is where shell oil, you know, wants to drill right here. So we just ran the model for three months, starting last this past August, and just said if you had a continuous spill, where would it go? Well, it didn't. It didn't come to Alaska. Right? It went over to Russia. So the the purple are the winds from from Noah's blended wind product, and they archive it, and the black are the currents from uh, the Navy's global model. So it's kind of cool. You know, there's an example of a plan. The guys at Shell haven't, haven't seen this yet. I, I would bet they'd be interested in seeing this. Um, okay, so, you know, what if, where, where would it go if, if it leaks? And this is pretty common. <coughs> Right, that the vessel is grounded, it sinks, it's not leaking yet. Where would it go if it leaked? And this one's hard because the conditions are changing and you don't know when it's going to leak. You know, is it, is it, the winds are going to change. You know, so this, this is one where it's really common and it's, it's not so easy because you don't know when the conditions are changing. So it takes, it takes some, uh, you know, it takes some thought. In this case, this thing's didn't. Sure. So this is this is you know, this is one of Jordan's recent ones. Uh, you know, this is this is what people want to know if it's gonna come ashore, where it's gonna come ashore. So if we if we think it's gonna come ashore or not, that's gotta be clear up front. It's important how you put it out, right? Nobody wants to read three pages and get to the answer. So what about planning for any incident, any time? So you know, if you're going to plan, how do you do that? Well, the way the way that you know we approach the problem is, is to look at statistics, look at past. So here's an example. In this case, we ran 10 years worth of currents and winds for San Diego, and we had a, say the spill was right here. Where would the oil go? What's the probability? So these. You can't read this, but these are this is the probability scale, so you can see. You know, it, it would it would go this way on average for these months here. Um, we have one of these, we call these TAP, trajectory analysis plan, we have these for several different areas. Uh, I think for for here, the, the exciting thing here is that uh, DOI, Bessie, the guys that monitor the rigs offshore here, they're paying the UCLA team $250,000 to model 10 years worth of currents and winds for Southern California. Two-year project. When that's done, they're going to be able to do this type of low spill analysis off the coast. You know, Sherburn has that lettering site. That's going to be just a natural to do this type of statistical analysis. But they're going to do it for all the platforms. Um, you know, Coast Guard might be interested in the shipping lane. You know, potential spills in the shipping lanes, and, and it'll it'll give you probabilities. They're they're going to go up to they're going to cover from Monterey Bay down to uh, the border of Mexico. So they're not going to go up to San Francisco. I know, no, Jordan. But it's it's very cool. They're they're paying a lot of dollars, and, and we're we're helping them out. Uh, another type of, of planning. So this is this is Waikiki, you know, my hometown here. So the Coast Guard said, okay, where could all come from to impact, you know, why can keep on ahead? So, and they were looking at the ship traffic. So this is another, another thing that we could put out. 48 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours. So, you know, response time on average. Okay, so one, one quick example of how did the forward runs. Okay, so this this is what we're doing in Texas now. This is what we did to people. 
water right now. Okay, so these are this is our, our website, public website. It, this is the data that's available. So this is what I will show you how to use it too. And you can see for the Gulf of Mexico we have a bunch of different models available. Examples. This is this is one model. These are currents. This is another one. This is Texas and Al. And you notice the currents are all different. These are for the same. They talk. They, they're never the same, right? You know. Uh, data. You need data to, to for a reality check, right? These these are these are winds. And so we, we were getting data from several different sources. Current meters, we had uh, vessels out there that, that were reporting currents to us. They put out drifters. HF radar, which, which you have off the coast here, you know, the CODAR. They had, we had satellite data every day, drifters, just like dozens of them. And, and the most important data set, overflights. So here's an example. These, these are drifters that were on the edge of the loop current. And you know, you look at this stuff and you figure, okay, how am I going to put this together and use this? And then uh, we got satellite analysis. We don't do the analysis. We get it from another branch of NOAA that does it for us. Overflights. Um, there's, there's the Canadian, John mentioned this, right? The Canadian SLAR. Overflex. So this is this is an actual overflight. And if you look at that that site that Jordan had up, we have <coughs> stuff like this for Texas. This is the this is the satellite. So this is the the SAR the satellite data. And, and as Judge said, you, know, you can see the outline. What you don't know is distribution of oil. How many, uh, how many buoys are out there? I mean, I, I don't know. Is it, you know, how far out do they go from the shore? There, there, are not, there, there aren't a lot. Of, if you go to the National Data Buoy site, you'll see there are not a lot of actual data buoys out there. But with the Gulf, the platforms, a lot of platforms report data. And they're also in the mm -hmm. system. For, for deep water, uh, you know, BP, Started reporting data because they had they had they're out there and then they put a current meter on the bottom, so that fed into the national system was publicly available. So that was kind of cool. So you know in, in the model no we, we could initialize off the satellite imagery, and then we could initialize by hand off the overflights. So these these are areas where the, the oil was heaviest. Then we put it together, right? So there it is in no. This is the no interface that that I'll go through a bunch. And then we run the model forward, we put in winds and run it forward, and we come out with a forecast. And these are the different pieces of the forecast, the uncertainty bounds, the heavier patches of oil. So here's an interesting story. When we started, this was a red, we, had, we marked the site with a red cross. And guess what? About a week into it, we actually got called by, by the red cross. And they wanted us to, to take the red cross off of the states and do something different. But these are the kind of things that happen, you know, in a big spill. So we have to, you know, we have to go back and put these little red stars on them, whatever. Um, the bar, bottom, scale. This, this was important. We wanted to know when the next one was coming out. So we put these out every day, once. So you know, the model was reinitialized every day for the field data. We need field data. If you don't do this, then your errors are just going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, multiple inputs. This is one of the reasons it took us so long every day. We would run the model with different inputs and compare the results. Then we get uncertainties from the different model runs. Uh, and then, you know, the artwork. We have to, we have to pick the best guess and, and smooth out the uncertainty patterns. And then we spent a lot of work on the, the format of what we put out to the public, what we put out to the command calls. That took a lot of work. Okay, last slide. 
So we do at least one a day on a big spill. If we need to, we do two a day, but for us, it's a killer. Okay, questions? <laughs>